Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us to help choose home when care is needed. We podcast all about the benefits, value, and safety of receiving care and services in the one place that feels most comfortable, wherever it is that the person needing care calls home. I'm your host, Marilee Orsini, and I've been involved in healthcare at home since 1981. Before we meet today's guest, a brief thank you to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and CoreCube. Today's episode is number four of season four. Our guest today is Eric Listu, co-founder of the Living in Place Institute. Eric has lots of credentials, but today we're going to focus on the certified living in place professional and the home and accessibility trade specialist. Please help me, won't you? And welcome Eric Listu to Help Choose Home. Eric, thank you so very much for joining me today. I am really excited to hear about the Living in Place Institute and to hear about what you do there. So how about we start with you talking about the Living in Place Institute? I'd love to. And first, I appreciate you for allowing me to be on this. We are quite excited about what the Living in Place Institute is doing. And we'd like for people to know, especially people who are thinking about a house and where they want to live. What the Living in Place Institute is, it's an educational organization. We provide professional education to everyone involved in the housing industry, from the developers to the contractors, the designers, the tradespeople, and even the medical experts that for the first time really in housing history, we've brought in the medical experts to help the construction people understand what would be best for the people who live there. And do you have some standard, you know, a checklist of if someone wants to age in place, what types of things should they be looking at in terms of home remodeling or home renovation or if they're building a new home? Well, we get asked that question a lot. And I always start with, I'm, I'm not going to help anyone age in place. Age is a very, uh, because it's becoming very questionable using that term. So to help people live in place, Yes, there are many things that we can do in a typical home. And I usually try to think, well, what about walking up to the house? Is it safe? Are there a bunch of stairs that might, you know, homes have stairs. That's fine. Are there proper railings? Is the lighting adequate? Are the stair steps themselves? Are they all consistent? Are they non-skid? There's a lot can be, we really, that's what the construction people do. You know, it's not just a set of steps. It's a whole lot of little parts and pieces. Then after I walk up to the front door and I open the door or someone opens the door to invite me in, let's make sure there's no step there, the door threshold. It is possible to have a front door with absolute zero threshold, not one little bump whatsoever, just a smooth floor. Then when you walk in the home, is the lighting appropriate? Can I see things? If I go to the kitchen, is there a wide enough space? Is the countertop not real shiny? Because that shiny countertop, when the light comes in from an open window, it can be blinding a little bit. So there's there are just so many things, Marilee, that, that we're trying to help the housing industry know everything, every component in a house. Let's look at it as an industry, let's bring in the medical experts again. Let's talk about how that could be made safer, and then let's just do it that way. Talk to me about those areas in the house where most accidents occur. I believe bathrooms is number one. Yes. And I'm at a loss for number two. Is that kitchens? You know, I honestly don't know. I would think the kitchen just because there's so many opportunities. But you're right, the bathroom. And it's interesting if we think of the bathroom being probably the most dangerous room in a home. Well, why is it dangerous? Why are there more accidents in bathrooms? Well, we have slippery floors in bathrooms. That's different than other rooms in the house. So maybe having a floor that is less slippery. Stepping into a bathing area, whether it's into a tub or into a shower area, there are many, many accidents that occur in what's called the transition point. Is there something to hold on to? 
the way we've traditionally built homes is there is a towel bar on the wall or a robe hook next to the bathing area. And I think about three-fourths of Americans wear eyeglasses or contacts. I wear eyeglasses. Of just the eyeglass wearers, that's about two out of every three people. So walking into that bathing area, I take my glasses off. So I am now vision challenged. I'm trying to step into an area with a slippery floor over the edge of a tub, nothing to hold on to. I don't have my glasses on. There's, you know, water might not be the right temperature. So I get a little jolt. This is why accidents occur. So what we're trying to help the industry understand to just include these items and for homeowners, finding someone who's qualified to install some items. I mentioned stepping into a tub or a shower. In my house, I put up a vertical bar. I call it a shower bar. I don't call it a grab bar. It's a vertical bar. It's a shower bar. So when I step in, there's something to hold on to. And I feel, I feel more comfortable. And if someone does tragically fall in a bathroom, typically bathrooms are very small rooms. And if a person is on the floor, it may prevent someone from opening the door just to check on someone, just to see if they're okay. That's why we teach, especially in the bathroom in a home, the door should never swing in. It either swings out or it's a sliding door. There's various ways to achieve that, but never set the stage for continuing a troubling or a dangerous situation like the fall in the bathroom. So if someone is planning on living in a house for the rest of their lives, it sounds like that the approach to the house is important, and it sounds like lighting is important, and it sounds like having a safe bathroom where you really thought that through is important. What about the kitchen? What kinds of things should a consumer be looking at in terms of making a house safe in the kitchen? Another great question. It's causing me to think. You know, I teach, all, I teach this every day to the industry, but I've spent my life as a building contractor and designer. So I have worn both the hats. So if I put on my builder and designer hat, I think, what is my customer looking for? They're looking for a kitchen that they like, a kitchen they can be comfortable in, just a kitchen that wants to make them want to cook again, makes them want to enjoy being in the kitchen. The kitchens have evolved. In fact, 1899 is when the first kitchen cabinet was invented. We didn't have kitchen cabinets before then. Kitchen was just a place where food was cooked. And because houses tended to be smaller, it was a communal gathering place. Then over the decades, we sort of got away from that. So 50 years after the kitchen cabinet was invented, we had kitchens that became little tiny galley kitchens almost, where you store everything. Then there is the family room and the dining room. Well, it seems that people are now going back to, I want to be around other people. I love to cook merrily. I do not like to cook when everyone else is in the other room having fun. Then cooking is a chore for me. But if I can have people around me, then I enjoy cooking. So what helps a person enjoy cooking? How about appliances that are easy to reach? An oven, not sitting down on the floor that I have to bend over to try to pull the turkey out on Thanksgiving? Or a microwave. Most people are now not putting the microwaves way up in the air. In fact, we have a little rule we try to follow. That's nose to knees. From your average person's nose to the knees, that's a comfortable location. So if I, as most kitchens now have, cabinets that go to the ceiling sometimes, how do I reach all those items? Well, the industry has come back with a solution. You can open up a cabinet door and the inside of the cabinet will actually lower down to the countertop. So I don't have to stretch or I don't have to pull out a kitchen chair and try to reach up into the cabinet. So this is my advice to persons who are looking to find that comfortable kitchen. Just walk in and look around. Sort of pretend that you're cooking right now. Think about, well, I open up the refrigerator and I get items out. Where do I put those to start cooking? What the industry calls the landing space. Where is the landing space? Is it convenient? Is it close to where I'm cooking? So I think the best advice I could give, Marilee, is 
just to stand in the kitchen and just to imagine cooking breakfast or making coffee or cooking a holiday meal or a child's birthday party. Think about what you would like to have in that kitchen and how it would make life better for you. I am uh, really wanting to ask you about the dishwasher. Are there any dishwashers that do not have, that are not in the normal place a dishwasher is, so you have to bend over and get them dishes out of it? Is there, has there been anything created that solves that issue? <laughs> Great question, yes. I can never understand. I'm 70 years old now, Marilyn, so I've been cooking in kitchens for a long time. I could never understand why is that dishwasher right here and why do I have to bend over so far to get into it? So you're correct. There are now things like drawer type dishwashers. So it's right underneath the countertop and it only goes halfway to the floor. It's a smaller unit. What many people are doing is just simply using the standard dishwasher, but raising it up. If you raise up that dishwasher about 16 inches off the floor, which is any cabinet company can give you a box or something that goes under there. Now that dishwasher door, when it opens, it's, you know, it's, it's almost two feet off the floor, makes it comfortable. Of course, it's sticking up above the countertop height, but that's a good thing because quite often we want different height countertops. Castling is what the industry calls it, where things are of different heights, makes it more convenient. So instead of just having countertops at 36 inches, which has always been the industry standards, maybe some areas in the kitchen, the countertop is several inches or more lower. Maybe some areas it's taller, like right where that dishwasher is. It's a higher space. So I can set things there that maybe a young child couldn't reach right now. So again, let's just think of it. That's a good question though, about a dishwasher. What about bedrooms? Bedrooms? Well, typically in our bedrooms, we have closets now. Remember I told you about the kitchen cabinets being vented in the late 1800s? Also, this somebody invented this device called a coat hanger, because believe it or not, closets were a place where you kept private goods. People, unless they were fluent, so most people didn't have multiple changes of clothes. They didn't have closets full of clothes. But as mass production and consumerism took off, you know, again, we're talking over 100 years ago, now we needed places to hang clothes. So we started creating closets. Well, is it easy to open the closet door? If we just think of a plain, simple closet, there's a door. I open it up, there's coat hangers. But when I'm getting dressed, is there a place that I can be comfortable? Why not just set a chair right next to that closet? It could be a built-in bench. It could be just a chair sitting there, a place where a person could sit down and put their socks on comfortably. If it's a larger walk-in style closet, same thing holds true. Is there a place I can sit and be comfortable while I'm getting dressed? Is there a place I can lay out my clothes and think about what I'm going to put on next? So again, think of how your lifestyle is and how you want to maintain. I guess from my childhood, my mother must have taught me, get the clothes out for tomorrow morning. And I guess I still do that. So in the morning, I don't have to be searching through my closet, what do I want to wear today? Because I'm too busy thinking about other things. But again, just make the closet so it's comfortable for a person to access lighting. I love the idea of automatic lighting. When I open a closet door, the lights come on. So I don't have to hunt around for a light switch. Um, is automatic lighting available? I should know this, but is automatic lighting available also for bathrooms? So when you enter into the bathroom, the lights come on automatically? Absolutely. In fact, some jurisdictions are now requiring that to happen. The ideal scenario is that, let's just say the bedroom bathroom, if it's in a master bedroom, there's probably a bathroom in that area. Yes, we definitely want the lights to come on when I walk in. But do you want all the bright lights to come on at three in the morning? Probably not. So it's now possible to have the lighting staged, if you will. So when a person gets out of bed, that motion triggers some nice soft lighting. And the experts will tell you about light reflectance value and, and Kelvin values. I don't want to get into too much details, but lights that won't wake you up 
just a nice soft light that lights up so I can see. That same system now turns on the light in the bathroom. I can go in there when I'm done in the restroom. I come out, I just go back into bed and, and you can set the times. So maybe five or 15 minutes later, those lights just dim down and go off again. So I've not disrupted my sleep, but I have a safe way to go into the bathroom. Let me make certain that for our consumer audience that they understand. So if they are getting ready either to build a new house or to renovate a space, they can actually, do they contact the Living in Place Institute or do they recommend that their builder or their contractor get with Living in Place Institute? Well, they can, what we have is a feature on our website that allows people to find a professional. But as we know in the building industry, there's never enough professionals. (laughs) So one thing to do is whomever your contractor or designer that the homeowner is talking to, tell them about the Living in Place Institute. Recommend that they reach out because again, we're teaching the industry. We're not a consumer organization on how to be safe. We're teaching the industry. Sometime this year, we will launch a consumer website that'll have, and this prompted by, you're one of the people, Marilee, saying, what's the list of questions? So we will have a website in the next few months that will help people to know that. But yeah, I think you're right. The best thing to do, whatever professional you're talking to, encourage them to reach out and learn from the Living in Place Institute what needs to be done to make not only your home safer, but everyone's. Eric, tell me in your personal space where you live, have you done all of the things in your space that you are recommending to builders that they do in the spaces they're building? You know, I'd love to say absolutely, But no, I haven't, because I'm no different than anybody else. I try everything I can. I try to do things as safe as I can. My house is full of night lights. I mentioned the bar stepping into my shower. I have low contrast colors in the floor. You don't have to do everything all at one time. It's one of the things we teach the professionals, the concept of now, soon, and future. What do I need to do now? So if I'm as I am talking to people who are looking at buying or renovating, walk into that space and think, what do I need to do now to make my life better? What do I need to do now to help my family, my visitors? What do I need to do soon? And the third list is in the future, what do I need to do? Because again, everybody can't do everything all at one time. You couldn't afford it. There's not enough time. There's not enough workers out there. Are you seeing a trend for people that staying in their homes longer than they used to? Yes. In fact, the AARP released a study that they update every couple of years called Fixing to Stay. And in that study, we learned that almost 90% of older adults want to stay in their homes. They don't want to move. They want to stay in their homes. They want to fix to stay. So we are seeing more trends. And of course, our our last year and a half has caused some other changes, more people considering multi-generational housing, people, uh, not just multi-generational, but we're hearing examples of just friends, friends deciding, well, you know, if we, we can share a place, whether it's financial or friendship or health reasons, we can help take care of each other. That COVID changed a lot of things in our country, and it's the jury's still out really as to what kinds of other things are are going to be changed. Do you see any other trends in living living in place other than communal housing and people being more interested in staying in their own home as they get older and frail? Well, I think it's the thinking was always as I age, then I'm going to need these things. I think the pandemic has helped us realize that don't wait until you age. It might be too late then. Why not make your life better now? What about your friends and family? Think of a 30-year-old couple. Do they have parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, neighbors that could come visit? Yeah, they all do. So we're seeing more and more trends with, I just want to make my house better. And as we all know, the pandemic has caused most people to stay inside their four walls for very long periods of time. So now we are seeing huge growth in the industry. More and more people are saying, okay, now it's time to fix my bathroom. 
Now it's time to update my closet. Now it's time to look at those front steps and maybe replace it with a nice sloping walkway that will look pretty, give me places to plant and make life safer for everyone. So I think the big change is, even though this was the directions in the industry were moving and advancing quickly towards helping the aging in the older population, I think the pandemic has caused us to relook and say, it's everyone, not just a certain population. Everyone, everyone needs a home that's safer. I love your idea to think about the fact that even if you don't, if one doesn't consider oneself as getting older and needing some type of environmental change that to think about your neighbors, your friends and your family. So I love that. Another thing to think of, is, I mentioned my age. If you tell me what would improve my house for my grandchildren when they visit, yes, I want that. So we're seeing that shift also now in the older population. What would you like to do in your home that'll make it more fun, more comfortable when your family visits? Hmm. I hadn't uh, thought of that, but you're right. The, the biggest blessing in the world so far is grandchildren that I can see. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sounds like you've been blessed too. Eric, is there something that I have not asked you today that you thought I would and that you would love to share with our audience? Well, I think I'll just sort of wing it here because as we know, I like just chatting with you, Marilee. I didn't want to prepare a, a speech and read it to people. What I would like to leave with people is their understanding how their home affects their lives. It's simple, but your home does affect our lives. So let's think about your life, your friends, your family, <laughs> your grandkids. Let's think about what we can do in our home that helps them. And you may be surprised because it will probably, I won't say probably, it will. When you make home improvements, it improves the value of your home, not just the financial value. Yes, that's important, but I'm talking about the value for others. I think in, in the U.S., I'm sure it's different now with the pandemic, but two years ago, the average family moved every 13 years. So don't just think about you. Think about, wow, there's going to be a whole different family here 13 years from now. In 26 years from now, there'll be another family. So let's, let's, as our combined legacy, let's leave our homes safer than when we moved in. Well, that is a wonderful thing to leave our listeners with. And I want to thank you so very much for joining me today. And because you literally do help people choose home <laughs> in your profession. Yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I, could, I couldn't think of a better life, Marilee, than to help people. Oh, great. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening today. And a special thanks to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and Core Cubed. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to our podcast and take the time to leave a review on Apple Podcast. We are now also on Spotify and most other places where you find podcasts. Like and follow us on social media and join us, won't you, to spread the word and help choose home when care is needed. <laughs>